you're probably actually surprised at what you are actually considered to be an expert in when you compare yourself to people who aren't in your immediate group. It's not about investing thousands of dollars into technology or anything like that. Doing a podcast is actually telling a story. Okay, so what's the workshop about, sorry? First of all, we're gonna cover how and why we did podcasting, the Space Brains podcast, what that is, briefly on that. But then we're gonna start talking about, you know, why people podcast, why would you want a podcast? And then some of the pre-production tasks, we're gonna have a few activities here to try and get some conversation going there. A bit of the production, topics around hosting of the podcast itself, uh, images, where to get sound and music from, a quick demonstration of like using some of the editing software and what that is, whether it's theoretically possible to make money out of podcasting, which, <laughs> I mean, it's an artistic endeavor, so you know, you can, I suppose. Some of the tips that we've learned on how to keep going. We've a little hiatus here while we're preparing for the festival, but 101 was a couple of weeks back. I was nope. I think if you haven't seen that, you should see it. Two thumbs up. Okay, so why Space Brains? Like where did we come from? Sari and I met as dads at a local primary school. We have a son each in a particular grade and dads are at school. They sort of are the minority. We're the minority group in that way as white middle-aged men. But we were there, so we started chatting. Birthday parties started chatting and, you know, a couple other sort of school events and we just kind of circulated that way and all of a sudden we realised that, hey, we are chatting about movies, books, science fiction and what our wives noticed was geez you two really do talk and you talk a lot so maybe you should think about doing something about that Surrey is a published science fiction author go check out his books they're very good and i'm a filmmaker so we kind of then you know investigated that on a more business professional level of thinking okay well what can we do from this knowledge base and that's really where Space Brains was then born. Our conversations can naturally go on for hours and hours and we can debate a science fiction film or whatever. Why don't we just hit record and see what goes from there? So that was like the birth of the idea of Space Brains. And we, we do keep a timer running while yeah. we're recording because <laughs> some of our episodes stretch beyond two hours and you're like, at a certain point we've got to stop. <laughs> yeah. We learnt very quickly and you know, this is one of those lessons as well, like structuring your podcast. We learned very quickly, you know, if we don't have some sort of structure, some sort of time frame, the next thing you know, it's three hours and it's 1 a.m. in the morning and we need to get up for work the next day and to get kids to bed and all that kind of stuff. So not ideal. So a timer was one of the, the best things you can do. So the question then is, why would a person start a podcast? It's why we started one. And there are people who do like to express their ideas, even if it's just a shout into the void. You probably want to have a niche idea. So there are an infinite number of podcasts which are people just talking about nothing. Literally just a group of friends get together and they just have a beer and talk. That is a certain niche. And there are some people who, who really just like listening on that. I've certainly read people asking the question like, I, I live remotely and I don't have a lot of friends nearby, I can't just visit them. So, you know, what is a nice podcast I can put on and it makes it sound like I've, I've got like a, a group of entertaining people around me. So there's that one. We went science fiction films, a hopeful view of science fiction and just enjoying watching. The difference being is that we don't rate the films we watch, so we've watched some absolutely appalling films. If you listen to in the lines of what we're saying, you can tell which ones they are. Do you think you need to have like a specific but, knowledge? So not just an interest, but a knowledge Well, yeah, mm. that's a really good question. Did you say you're an architect or engineer? Sorry, engineer, right? So you could, I'm just saying spitballing here, you could do an engineering podcast. There's specific types of engineers. So your podcast could go that niche that you're going to talk about your area of engineering. <laughs> yeah, so you've got to have that motivation to want to do it. The great thing with podcasts, I believe, is it's not like you need a university degree actually in engineering you could just be someone that's really super passionate about engineering and then therefore you do a podcast on engineering you um, probably want to state that you're an enthusiast and not like like if you're talking about medical science you yeah. definitely want to say i'm not a doctor or anything but i do like reading about these things in you know nature or the the national institutes of health or whatever it is yeah 
Uh, yeah, you've got a question. Another question. How much research would be given into a subject before you start talking about it? Like some of the YouTube channels I follow, I know Johnny Bark and Rowan J. Coleman, they put a lot of research mm. into them. Yeah, I, it's going to depend. I mean, for example, we're doing films, so we, we watch the film, so that's a couple hours of research. But then outside of that, there's a few more hours there. There's there's research specifically for an episode that you might do, but there's also research, as we said, like getting an engineering degree was part of your research to do an engineering podcast, or just the fact that you know, you, you're a filmmaker, you've been making short films and so forth, and that's part of it. Usually, if you're talking about a niche idea or a specific thing, the more informed you are and able to present informed ideas, probably the more entertaining you are. However, I do know there are some podcasts about people who know nothing about a topic and then try to talk about it. And like, that's, their, that's their thing is like, I'm going to tell you all about neurosurgery. Just on that, it does come down to maybe the type and we will go through some of the types of podcasts in a moment. So, you know, if it is the three or four mates sitting around having beers, talking, just whatever, I mean, how much research is there for that? They might do zero research. The podcast is more their friendship on the podcast. And as Sari said, like for us, it requires watching the film. It requires maybe doing a bit of a deeper dive onto the filmmakers, what they were intending. If we're going to talk about, Sari talks about a particular bit of science, he does research on that. But you don't need to do hours and hours. It just sort of maybe depends on your topic. You may get a heart surgeon in the room. You're talking about heart surgery and that heart surgeon goes, I don't need to do any research. I've been doing this for 30 years. I am the expert. So it sort of depends on what you're talking about. So other reasons here, okay, building a brand and business expertise. I know there are a number of brands which have a podcast about their product or about the industry they work in in order to build up this idea that they are genuinely interested in their industry. You know, if you have Rode, for example, who are all about audiovisual stuff, you know, they, they, we've got the podcasting thing here. This is a, a Rode mic I'm wearing. So. I think they actually do have a podcast do, which yeah. talks about not just their products but about all of the aspects of using those sorts of products. The idea being then that it adds a bit of credibility, it gives them somewhere to point to. You're interested in learning about this roadcaster. Well here's episode 15 where we spoke to a couple of people using it and we go through the technical details of it. It's sort of like your website where you might have a blog a podcast can be used for a similar sort of thing. You get to intimately connect with people. When I'm listening, I've got earbuds in. It's blocking out the rest of the world. I'm doing my gardening. Whoever's talking my ears has my undivided attention, really. So it's kind of handy that way. Lots of people listen to podcasts, both intentionally, as in they sit there and they purposely go, I want to learn this particular topic. Here's a podcast. I'm going to do it. This guy, Brendan Bashad, he's got his book called High Performance Habits. And then he did a podcast where he just basically, it was the audio book, but in podcast form. And I went, I want to know that because that's something I do or want to do anyway. I want to have high performance habits. There's apparently 9 million Aussies, at least once in the past month, they've listened to at least one podcast. There's quite a lot of people to get to. So there's like those types of podcasts. You have two guys in the room that kind of break down a science fiction film. You have an interview style, you know, and who's the number one in the world? Joe Rogan. Rogan, right. His style is to interview someone, all right? So that's like that interview show. Dax Shepard, pure interview. Every episode, they get someone on to interview. That's kind of almost like a talk show. They talk to someone. I love listening to these ones. I like the Dax Shepard one because he goes really deep. It's two to three hour conversations he has with a lot of the time people in the film industry or the creative sector. But he also does get on doctors and scientists and all sorts of things. But what I like is that, yeah, it is a two hour conversation. I told you I like talking. So I like listening to that too. And it's quite an intimate conversation versus, you know, on talk shows, late show, whatever, they come on for two minutes and they spruik about their latest movie and that's it. It's two minutes, you know, it's very sales. Whereas these conversations can go on and on and on. That is an option you have. Do you want to do an interview show? We have done, I think, three interviews three, yeah. over our 101. That's not been our intention, but what's happened is we've reviewed a film and then we've had the filmmakers reach back to us. And that's been a really great thing. In fact, it happened within a couple of episodes. We had the British filmmaker of The Beyond do a lot of social media saying, this is a great podcast, love what they said about our film. That's happened a bit organically for us, but we have done that. And it's a very different style of episode. 
where we both felt confident as a partnership is that, yeah, I'm a filmmaker. I've been making films since I was about 10. So I feel like I've got some expert knowledge to deliver there. Sari is really into science, he's an IT engineer, and he's written sci-fi books. We've been doing this as adults, been interested in this subject matter for about 20 years. So we bring that to the table. It's not like we're saying we've got these degrees in science fiction, but we bring 20 years of knowledge each of us collectively onto every podcast episode, you know? But don't deter that, you know, you can, everyone can become an expert. I mean, Elon Musk, I know he has a big quote out there. Everyone can get a university degree on YouTube now. Yeah, and you can. So don't be deterred from that. But that's something to think about, like what are you an expert in? Like what's your niche? What's your thing? And I think interestingly, you might be surprised at what you are actually an expert in. Yeah. I was actually watching a thing on the Dunning-Kruger effect and how Oddly enough, most people misunderstand the results of it. For those who don't know it, the Dunning-Kruger, the real point of it was that people who are very expert at something, when they're trying to compare themselves to what they think other people know, they underestimate their own knowledge. They think that, oh, other people already must know most of this stuff. Like, how could you not know where to find podcasts, for example? Because I've been doing that for years. You know, and the answer is because I've been involved in that for so long and all the people I talk to have been doing it for so long, I think everyone, must know how to do it. As it turns out, there's only three people in all of Australia maybe who know how to get a podcast. And none of them listen to us, no. And <laughs> so that's the idea. For example, I'm in IT. Mike, I know you're a software engineer as well. My whole career, I've been working in buildings surrounded by software engineers or people working very closely with. They're all university graduates with bachelors of science. And so I come out into the world and I look around and go, if these guys aren't doing IT, what are they doing? I mean, there's whole office buildings filled with people and they're not engineers, they're not software engineers. What the hell are they doing? I mean, I guess you've got to have someone like keeping chairs warm up. So as a result, I would seriously underestimate how much you're out in computers I know compared to someone who, for example, has spent their entire life doing accounting. You know, they know how to operate a computer to do accounting. And they'd probably assume that I know all about, you know, negative gearing and self-managed super funds and tax implications of uh, annuities. And I don't know, I'm just saying words now. <laughs> but still, that's the thing. So when you're talking about experts, you're probably actually surprised at what you are actually considered to be an expert in when you compare yourself to people who aren't in your immediate group. Yeah, we're all experts in something. We definitely are. There is the journalism style, so obviously like investigative podcasting, so it might be investigating a crime, you know, a political campaign, anything like that. There's storytelling, and this is an interesting one, again, if you're building a brand. I've seen some authors, you know, they're trying to get their brand put out as an author. One way they can do that is turn their book into a podcast. So the podcast is not interview, it's not people reviewing a film, it's literally a story, so like an audio book but they turn it into a podcast. So, you know, we watch Netflix eight episodes, you could do eight episodes of your book. Or if you're a short story writer, it could be each episode is one of your stories. Sorry, actually did this with a book of his, or did you do all three? I did the other way around. Yeah, you did the, the other, other way around. I wrote an audio play, three seasons, 47 episodes, and then for each season I turned around and wrote a novelization of it. Yeah, doing a podcast is actually telling a story. You know, we all love stories. My kids love hearing, you know, the picture books before they go to bed. As humans, we love stories. Like it's the number one thing we do is stories. We've been doing it around the campfire. We do it now in the digital space. Like we're still doing it. Pure promotional brands, you know, like you mentioned Rode, a lot of the big brands are hop on podcasts now. And I've had this experience in the content creation for commercial companies where you know, CEOs go, ah, oh, we do this really exciting thing, which is not exciting. Let's do a podcast, you know, and they start pitching to me, yeah, create 10 episodes about, and that's about as far as they get, because they've just got, you know, we do this, we make these. Isn't it great? Do a podcast about it, you know, and, and go write 10 episodes for me, you know. So you can, you can put on your creative hat and do it, but yeah, pure promotional podcast, really the small business advisory service. So if any of you do run a small business, that's sort of a WA government service for free. So you can register through them. They ran a podcast workshop and there is actually a Mandra guy who runs a business about, he can do your podcast. 
he pitches that to businesses and he offloads a lot of the actual job of podcasting. So he's got like a writer in Indonesia, like you can record online, you know, an editor elsewhere in America or something. So yeah, you sort of employ his services and then he will make 10 episodes. So Sari and I, when we did actually go, yep, we've got the idea, we're doing this. We came up with the structure of the show. This all took a couple of months of brainstorming. You know, it took us a bit to get to exactly our niche before we hit record. And we'll come to this in a moment. But seasonal, so that very first year that we decided to do it, we said they're gonna be fortnightly. That's what we could commit to. So we'll really stick with fortnightly and we wanna stay fortnightly. And we started, I think, kind of late January in that first year to hitting record on our very first episode. And we've decided we're gonna go all the way to December. We're gonna do this fortnightly for the year, all right? And then we'll reassess whether we go another year. Heaps and heaps of podcasts are seasonal. So what I mean by that is they might be 10 episodes, they might be 20 episodes. So for us, that worked out to be about 22 episodes for the year. And then we repeated that pattern the next year. So that's what I mean by seasons. Some of the biggest crime podcasts out there, you know, they might do a crime, you know, going back in time, looking at a cold case and it's 10 episodes, that's season one. And then season two is another crime, all right? So like, th that's what I mean by seasonal. There, I do wanna note, there is a bit of integrating all of this. So for us, we have done three episodes, which are interviews, because we've had that opportunity to interview a director and we feel there's value in that for our audience. And you know, storytelling is part of our podcast as well. We do tell stories within our actual podcast. So there's a bit of mixing, like all media you mix up the genres a bit. We wanna kind of give you our five years of experience and just shortcut that a little bit for you. You don't need to go out with a bunch of money. You can start super cheap. You can use the technology that you have. You don't need to kind of invest in lots and lots of stuff. It's more about just some time, like it's investing in yourself time-wise. We started with the plan of the first year and we committed to that as business partners. But we said we would reassess at the end of the year whether we wanted to do another year. And we actually do that every year. So like we come back at the end of the year and make sure that each other is happy with the progress and where we're heading, et cetera. You start, if you like it, great, keep going. If you don't like it, stop. It's not about investing thousands of dollars into technology or anything like that. We did start with the bare bones of stuff we already had, stuff we could get for free and utilizing the free subscriptions and all that sort of stuff as best as possible. I had a baby, I think, at the time. So my place was totally out of the call, whereas Sari's kids are a little bit older. And Sari also had space out the back of his house that was quiet enough. We had to turn off a fridge that was in there every time we went to record. Very noisy fridge. Which was a very noisy fridge. Why I'm saying this is you can just start in your space. Audio is great in small rooms. You've probably all seen the vision of musicians recording in recording studios. You've probably seen that sound booths for radio. Yes, that's the ideal world, but with sound, you can also just work in small, quiet spaces. This room, you can probably, if you listen, hear a bit of an echo of my voice. Wouldn't be the best room to record in, okay? So if we had to record in here, it's actually about filling the space. So you could put in furniture, you could put in chairs, desks, anything, people would actually help. But if we could, maybe there's another room that's much smaller here. If you have a cupboard, a cupboard can work. All right, yeah, sounds weird. The room here, actually. Yeah, yeah, I was so gonna say, I'm there's got small many rooms, even got the egg crate foam on the walls. I had a bit of a look in there. It's, that would be quite a good spot. That's great, but it costs money, right? So again, like just trying to limit that the cost. If you have a cupboard or a wardrobe, a walk-in wardrobe potentially, lots of clothes, lots of soft fabrics that stops echoing. You know, jump in there, close the door, and you've got actually a quiet space, all right? So no kids, no dogs, lock all them outside, yeah. give them a bowl of water, they'll be fine. <laughs> the point is to soften the sound. Really large spaces are not gonna be great. The other thing then is also outside noises. Surrey had a beautiful old golden retriever that always wanted to say hello. Of course, you'd say hello and then kick it out, but it might be outside scratching the door or something like that to come back in for more cuddles. The whole point with sound recording in general is try to get it right as you record. David's aware of that right now, the videographer at the back there. <laughs> you know, the best sound you can record, less editing, the better. Yeah, and I, okay. I keep touching my microphone, so yeah. <laughs> my sound's gonna be a little bit David's, dunch. you know, scratching <laughs> down the wall. So anyway, the point of this anyway, we can start with very minimal thing. In fact, you could just use 
Android, Apple, phone. Like this could be your very first episode is all done on this with this beautiful little piece of computing technology. It's a sound recorder, okay? Inside these phones, whether Apple or Android, there is very minimal editing software, free. It's in the phone. You could edit a podcast on that. You then, if it's connected to the internet, can produce it onto the internet. So effectively, this can do a podcast. It's bloody amazing, really. Try not to be in echo spaces. Something that I always do with film as well as it's good to walk into a space and listen. Automatically, I can hear an echo here. My ears are noticing that. So the microphone will pick up an echo, all right? We've so, also, also got an air conditioner, you know, on, which fridges, you can hear a whatever, slight you know. hum. So what you do need is a microphone. Your phone does have a microphone. We did recording to phones, was the first few episodes. We used, used so, ourselves just a, a little lav mic. I got mine from AliExpress for $2.78 with free shipping, <laughs> but that took about six or eight weeks to arrive. I think you, you went down to JB Hi-Fi and, and shelled out the $70 and got yeah. the Rode There's a Rode, mic. great mic in the, the quality between the two for this sort of work, basically negligible. Yeah. It comes down to, yeah, if you're gonna try to record more important things or out in the wilderness where you, you need better pickup and I have to admit, your mic had slightly better bass pickup. Yeah. Mine was a little bit more mid-tones, but yeah, but my, mine was $2.70, yeah, $2.70 to mean, about you know, $70. Yeah. So thinking about that, and it's just, again, options. You may also be able to borrow a microphone from someone. You might have that ability. My, but we just had my the, first mic actually was Xbox had the rock band game. It was actually a, a USB mic that came with that. That was the first one I had. That incredibly sensitive dynamic mic, and I had to be very careful, and, and I had like a, a doona over me and like talking, you know. <laughs> Well, that's why I was, why I was waiting for my, my lav mic to turn up. Just sort of... When he was doing your audio book, you came over to my house and we went under a blanket and my, my wife was like, what the hell are you guys doing under a blanket? <laughs> Adobe has got some really fancy AI stuff. It'll actually listen to the sounds in your room and it will figure out, much like you, you've seen background removal these days, you could just get a photo and say, remove the background, there's just the person. It, it can do the same thing. It can figure out what is your voice and it'll go get rid of everything else. It can even distinguish two different voices and then automatically transcribe for, for multiple different voices. The only thing I'd say is A, once you get into editing, it's what I said before, you're starting to use more and more time. And then the third thing is, you know, the better you can just record it and then avoid that, you know, it's saving you time, money, you know, frustration points, all of those sort of things. The other, my experience even editing film with changing sounds and getting rid of, even if you use those auto features, is that voices do become a bit distorted. I mean, you might not care, but if you're really into it and you want it to sound like your voice or sound a particular way, then it, it can distort it in a negative way. We did do, we were both recording, as we said, we had those little mics, we we're just recording into our phones, uploading it to Google Drive, doing a quick edit. There's Audacity, which is great sound editing software. It's, there is a free version of it. Fantastic, jump on that. What's the Persona Studio for? Uh, it's multi-track software. So yep, I use that more one. for my audio drama where I needed to have multiple voices, sound effects, I need to layer them do some audio changes, you know, volume attenuation and, and left, right panning and that sort of thing. I don't use that anymore for our conversation. Like since, since we've upgraded to the, the Rodecaster Pro 2, it costs about a thousand dollars, but it's got most, it's probably got about 80% of my audio editing workflow built in during the record phase. So you can get the raw sound, but I record the edited sound so my editing has gone you know for an one and a half hour episode has gone from four hours down to about 40 minutes because it just it just comes through so good and then pinecast for actually the hosting so what's that for sorry hosting so you once you've recorded it you need it somewhere what apple itunes google play amazon podcast can get a hold of that file and serve it up to you so you listen to it you don't want to have that just on your own website because you'll run out of disk space very quickly. Possibly you've got bandwidth limitations. The hosts basically have you know, massively cheap, enormous storage. They'll hold the file and produce what's called an RSS stream, which is just a, it's a text description 
of what that episode is, where the file is found, does it have any images with it. So it's just a little text description. It's that text description that iTunes, for example, will read and they'll create their own you know, interface for that, which will allow you to go click, oh, there's 15 episodes, I want episode three. It'll, it'll say it's this file, it's this image, starts here, here's some text with it, and off it goes and gets it. So again, this is where we were starting with a lot of these free things, just trying to get it rolling. Sorry, out of curiosity, what's the advantage of podcasts over something like, like Libsyn? Uh, yeah, okay, so Libsyn is very uh, long standing and running. It's got a lot of features. It is a bit old fashioned and it's a bit more expensive. And when I was using it, it only allowed for one show per account. So you paid your 15 bucks a month, one stream, that's it. Pinecast, you can have as many streams as you like. So I've got four or five different podcasts in the one account and it's like five bucks a month. So, or five US a month, so it's $8 or whatever it is. Um, go with whichever one you're, you're comfortable with. But I, yeah, there's a billion of them. But I have just found that that Pinecast, it, it meted my needs. It was simple enough to use, inexpensive enough, and uh, you know, it did everything that Libsyn did, but it was just a bit easier to do. So then the last just point there was at the start, we, as I said, took a couple of months. We came up with basically a script of the show, and that was just in a Google Doc that we brainstormed over these couple of months. We've talked about that idea of a niche and a point of difference. For us, it was, we don't want to just be a movie review show. We want to actually go a lot deeper into the filmmaking and the science behind it because that's our expertise. So that was kind of our niche. And the side point of that was we also wanted to just pick on the positives of any movie. So even if we watched a movie and we thought this is not a great movie, we would think what is good about it? Like what are those, just those good parts? We didn't want to be movie reviewers that tore you know the butthole out of a filmmaker we just wanted to say well these are the good bits this is what you can take from this film so that was our niche in terms of the structure of the show we started with you're going to ask this question and i'm going to kind of say this and then i'll say this and you will say that and then you'll say this and then you say that and we were creating the to and fro and that is really weird so like i said we met and we'd have two hour conversations very naturally suddenly when you hit record you're like was that good, Sorry, Sorry's like, yeah, it was good. Like, it, it suddenly was awkward, you know, and we, we knew this in advance, so we, we really blasted out a, a, a structure that was what I would call a script. So we were writing down, oh, this is what I think I will say, and this is what you will say. And we stuck with that probably for about 10 episodes. And then after that, it's evolved. It's kept changing, and it became less and less of a script and more... Well, these are going to be my rough dot points. These are your dot, rough dot points. You will ask this question and you will ask this question. So we have a setup. And if you listen to the show, the first sort of 10 minutes, there is an introduction the way we do it, which is a script essentially. And we've done it so long now that we, we basically know it. But then there's certain questions that Sari asked me and I asked him. And that's just that initial flow of the show. But then after that, it is pretty flow, free flowing. And yeah, we did that then for about 25 more episodes and realized, oh, hang on, now we need to condense this and we need to cut that and we want to add this. We want to put that section at the back and this section at the start. And we're sort of looking to see where we could add a bit more value because we can just talk about you know, the film, but then we thought, well, well let's talk about how, how narratives are structured. You know, what is a three act structure and what, what is an inciting incident and what's the midpoint? And when you, how do you apply that to this film you know, at what point does the, the, the story inflect? What are some of the tricky ways that good writers use this structure but hide it? Because, you know, we're, we're finding that there's this tendency of thinking it's a formula. And if you watch Pixar films, they are pretty formulaic, very entertaining, and they do it very well. But you, you sort of line them back to back and there's a new one out, Elemental, coming out. And it's like, hi, welcome to Elemental City. We're each in a separate spot and we all do different things. And then one of us goes to a place that they're not supposed to be and then they bring the other person back to where they're not supposed to be and then we somehow all become friends. And you're like, that sounds like every other Pixar <laughs> film. Yeah, but they do it really well and it's very entertaining. You know, they, they make a lot of money. We figured we could add that value in that I Am Legend, for example. It has a inciting incident which is actually as a flashback so the the inciting incident of the film occurred 
earlier in the narrative timeline, but it doesn't get presented until later on like that. It's just sort of makes it a bit more interesting. So we, we have been changing our script in order to try and bring that value so that people can, you know, there's a bit of analysis there, you know, how has this film, Nope, dealt with this aspect of storytelling, for example. And we have recently, I think Nope was actually the, the most recent incarnation of our thing where we've backed out on some of the longer running things we're doing. We listen back to episodes and go, that part of the episode, you know, I listened for half an hour to my own episode, listening to it, before I thought, oh, hey, I'm supposed to be taking notes about what's good. And I thought, <laughs> that must have been a good half hour if I, if I was listening to it and was entertained. So we go, well, let's do more of that and less of this other stuff. So it, it is an evolving thing. I've had coffee. <laughs> so let's get some ideas down. Podcast ideas, maybe a subject matter. It doesn't have to be a real thing you're really going to do but maybe it's something you want to do. What's the niche you're looking for? We've developed our niche, we call it joy watching. So you might watch that Bruce Willis film, Cosmic Sin. It's got some really good points to it. And it's very interesting. It's a great study on narrative technique. So that's joy watching. Yeah, like we, we could have said all sorts of things about that film, but there's good things to learn from it. You can watch it and, and that's the way we approach it. And that's our niche is to go, even this is a, it's a kind of a really ordinary film. If I was going to be a storyteller, what could I learn out of this? If I was going to be a director, what would I learn? If I'm an audience member, how can I watch this and actually get joy from it? <laughs> Which is a challenge for some films. Other films, it's really obvious. Like we have every fifth episode is a classic. And they're usually ones that you don't need to work too hard to enjoy. There's something really good about them anyway. So that was our sort of niche target audience. We're still working on who our target audience is. It is difficult because it's a record release and any feedback could be months or years later that someone comes back and says, oh, that episode, I really liked you did that. And you went, oh, really? We, we thought no one liked that. And we just, okay. So finding your target audience, you need to have some idea of who's gonna listen to this. So when we're talking about microphone, if you're recording to your phone, the really super important thing is there's these little black or white plastic rings at the base. If you're plugging to a phone, a mic, you need three of them. If you get a plug with just two, it will not work. And that's because the phone port at the bottom, if you've got a, a, an iPhone, you can't even use one of these. So. But anyway, the phone port at the bottom here is a combination stereo and microphone so that you can do you know, hands-free type stuff. And that's why you need the extra ring on here because it covers off the stereo and the microphone input. If you just have two, it will not work. For the Apples, however, there is a, an official Apple adapter for about $14. Yes. So, yep, <laughs> all right. Which so, you, you'll still need the three ring adapter. You'll still need the mic, but there is an adapter, okay? And it is readily available, you know, JB, for example. The other example. handy thing to note is when you're recording into a phone, you might have two people, you're doing a conversation or an interview or something. If you have two phones, each recording independently, the recording can be slightly out of sync. And that's because there's a bit of software jitter, basically. The way it encodes and, you know, speech or sound is to take samples every, you know, one sixteen thousandth of a second or something, who knows? Depends what you set it to, 44 megahertz. And then it, it makes a number out of that and it sticks it into a spot. And of course, two phones recording the same bit of sound might have a slight different point at which they take that sample. And so your first couple of minutes might be perfectly synced. By the end of an hour, you could be you know, half a second out and it, you get this weird echoing. You also have the problem of one microphone picks it up at this time, the sound travels across to the other microphone, you get what's called mic bleed. That's where the sound that's supposed to go in the missed microphone gets picked up by that microphone and you get a slight echo. One way to reduce that is you can use one of these splitters or a, you know, this one has three. So this will take three microphones in, stick it into the one port. So the one phone is recording all three mics. The downside means that all voices will come in the one audio track. So if you've got someone who talks loudly and someone who doesn't talk loudly, it can be a bigger challenge to equalize volumes. But there's some software that I'll, I'll briefly touch on, which is incredibly clever at making voices 
similar volumes. And the final thing with the phone, put it on flight mode. Yeah, flight mode. Yeah. So that no one can ring you. But we found in the early days, because we didn't do flight mode for the first couple, is these phones sometimes make little noises as well. So it wasn't something I was really thinking a phone does, but they can make little clicks and noises in the background. I guess it's the processor maybe, but flight mode avoids all of that. The phone totally kind of goes dead. The easy option just to remember to do. So don't put it on silent, flight mode. So that's the mic and the recording device. You can also plug straight into a computer and that's where you might want a two ring mic or a three ring mic. This computer has separate mic and headphone inputs. So that means I'd want a two ring mic. My other laptop, which is down there, has a one combined, which again, you need the three ring like that. So I went and bought a bunch of lapel mics for interviews and accidentally got the two ring mic and they were basically useless to me. So that was $10 or so I don't get back. That's so just, why I go around Just the making sure the rings on your mic input are three. Yeah, three. So then, you, then you've got no problem. So you can see them, you can more than welcome to come up and have a look after the session. Just three black rings, okay? So one is mono, two is stereo, and I, then three is I do is have that on the cheat sheet here. It does mention the three and a half mil plugs. Really easy not to do, but like just make sure you're getting that one and then you're fine. They all cost the same, you know, so. And if you're moving on to mics which are like table mics or whatever there's two varieties one is a condenser and one's a dynamic this took so long for me to figure out because everyone says all different things a condenser mic requires a separate power input like the little bit which picks up your sound has to have power running through it in order to pick up the sound so you need phantom power it's called like a little block like this or these integrated mixers will probably have phantom power, but you've got to look for phantom power if it's a condenser. Dynamic, sound is just picked up by wobbling a magnet with the sound of your strength of your voice. They're far more sensitive. Condenser mics are good for picking up speech and they have what's called a cardioid pattern. So there's an area in front of them that they're most sensitive and they're least sensitive outside of that. So they're really good. Mark and I will be sitting maybe about a meter or so apart his voice barely comes through on my mic because my, my, my mouth is really close to the mic and his is a meter away. Dynamic mics are really good for singing and live performances because they will pick up a much higher range of frequency. We're not singing. Most speech is within Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Sometimes. Future episodes. Uh, but it, most speech is within a fairly narrow range of frequencies. So generally speaking, a condenser is what you're going to want for podcasting because it picks up less interference from everyone else. If you've got a really nice studio, like you'll see Joe Rogan, for example, they've got like these, the shotgun mic thing as that they're probably the dynamic, like sure SM 57, they're like a few hundred dollars each. And they give you like a really nice rich tone. You get that, that real radio voice presenter sort of thing, but you need to have a very quiet, proper studio and setup, which you probably won't have because there's not many of them around. And I mean, this setup that we got here was something like 60 to $70 by memory. This microphone set up. Like yeah. this actual setup, it's a no brand microphone. Okay, so again, with all, like everything we're saying, there's an AliExpress thing, eBay, whatever. You know, if you go to the road version of that, it's, it's around $400. And you'll get slightly better sound. You will get better sound, but again, it's what we said earlier with even the $2 lapel to the $70 lapel, it's only ever so slightly better. So again, it comes down to just budget and what you maybe want to invest in things to start with. If you've got a great big credit card, someone else is paying, and go for most it. Most people you know. are listening on low quality earbuds in yeah. a noisy environment anyway. So if you're Michael Buble and your podcast is about how wonderful your voice is, you probably want an expensive mic with a good studio. If you're me and yeah, I, I speak in a remarkably narrow band of frequency. Like when we had separate tracks, I'm looking at mine, it's like this. I go, geez, that's a bit dull. And Mark's is all over the shop and it's just like, uh, yeah. so. Editing software, you can go as simple as the basic voice recorder on your phone. They'll let you cut sounds, it, it skips gaps. You can make it louder or softer. You can do a lot of different things with that, but only so much. You can get more advanced sound editors for your phone, I'm sure. I use software called Audacity, which is free, it's open source, it's been running for a long time. 
There's a lot of users of it, so there's a lot of help available. You have to do a search for it. There's YouTube tutorials. That's why it's good. I listed a couple of others there. They said there's like Reaper, which is also a free one. Some people swear by it. I found it harder to use, a little bit more complicated. Maybe if you are a bit more from an audio editing background, you'd probably prefer that. I didn't. And then there's some other stuff, you know, there's, there's obviously Adobe has Audition, I think Audition, it's yeah, which is really advanced. It doesn't cost software. that much, really, no. if you think about it, like, particularly if you're doing a lot of audio sort of stuff, but it comes with like a lot of Adobe magic, which when, when it comes to your, your workflow and your time, it can be really helpful because time is money. Graphics, you'll, you, you need like a little cover page some people have per episode I, I do one for, for each episode with the name of the movie we're doing a lot of podcasts that they just have a cover title and that's it you can do that yourself if you're really graphic-y you can get jump on a fiver and ask someone else to do it and even better yet now you can just use AI and that'll get you 80% of the way there type in something simple to AI you'll get a an image that's good enough and, and you can get cracking Hosting, I use this thing called PicMonkey, but that's only because back in the day, that's what my wife was using when she's doing her graphic design for people. It's, it's pretty cool, actually. It's, it's good for photo manipulation. Canva, which, has anyone ever heard of Canva? Yeah, it's oh, oh my God, most of the people that say Canva, they go, what? Is it, uh, like, it's a $40 billion Australian tech company. How could you not? But then I live in the world of IT, so, and I actually... Yeah. yeah, yeah, I actually, they were my first clients. That's, that's, and, and I didn't, when they said, we're doing this thing, you want to come to Sydney and be our IT team? And I said, no, you've got no hope of making any money on that. It's just rubbish. Yeah. I applied for a job there not long ago and they said no. So they're lost. Yes. Yes. And so now I'm a wealthy podcaster. Uh, okay, so then the hosting is the next thing you need. I started with Libsyn as one of the originals. It's very reliable. It's in quotation marks expensive. I originally thought it was expensive. I did my audio drama on that and I was writing it at a writing group. Every week I'd go to this pub, meet a bunch of other writers, of course. I'd have a pint of beer and a bowl of chips and I'd write. And then I, and I thought $15 a month, gee, that's a bit pricey. I realized I was spending about $20 a week at the bar writing the thing. I thought, oh, hang on, I just have to, all I just have to do is skip one pint of beer each month and that would pay for my hosting. So that's why I say it's expensive in quotation marks. It, you know, we are talking relative terms here. There's all these other ones. There's, there's Blueberry, there's Bud, Buzzsprout, there's Anchor. Anchor was kind of renowned for the fact that it was a, a phone app where you did everything on the phone. So you recorded into the Anchor software, you edited, you did it all up and you posted it all in one thing. Can I just break that yep. down? Hosting is where you, you make your audio file. Yeah. It's just on my computer here. People need to listen to it. So I need to get it out onto the internet in a public space where people's computers and phones can connect and can listen to it. So there's no, there's no free. There is. Pinecast has a free version. The free tier lets you have 10 episodes current at a time. You can have as many episodes as you like, but it'll only do the last, the most recent 10. And you can only, I think the free tier, you can only have one show. So one, one stream. So Space Brains is one show. So that's, that's free. And where do they send it? That's what Sorry said before, they create that file that then Spotify, like we mentioned Spotify for Android users or Apple iTunes or Apple Podcasts then reads it from that website. So that's why it's called hosting. So it's like you put your audio file onto this host site and then all any anyone that can listen to a podcast, any of those apps that say we play podcasts, all they're basically doing is like an old TV antenna tuning into this website and so an apple user looks at apple Podcasts and goes oh space brains but all it's doing is it's just redirecting from that website to apple Podcasts. so so many 
platforms now yeah. you watch these things or which ones do you recommend it's still Spotify and yeah and it does depend like if you want people on your YouTube channel then it's worth probably investing that time to get it on your YouTube channel but if you're not into video or anything like that like you just want to have the audio I think what Pinecast has worked really well for us I'll take you through that I'll jump on a Pinecast I'll create a free account up on here and show you that, that the process of uploading a file, creating a podcast episode, and even show you then, then how you can distribute it out to the pod catchers, as they're called. Do you define the categories you're in or just the... Yeah, that's part of your stream. So the podcast standard stream definition is a, a list of you know, text that you provide to iTunes, for example. And you can go in and say, this is the name of my podcast. This is the publishing company or the people involved in it. Here's an email address to get to me at. Here's the audio file location. And one of the things is here's the categories. And the categories are sort of this predefined, quote unquote, standardized categories. iTunes and a lot of those places have their own additional categories. And you can, you can jump into like iTunes, make an account there. You can find your podcast, prove your own, and then you can add things there in addition to what you stream you out. Can define your own categories. You can, but that's in two ways. You define them on your stream, so, but they're fairly broad ones. So we're in arts and entertainment. You know, it's not, it's kind of open. And if you're an audio drama, I think they've only just recently added an audio drama section. Otherwise, you're just in storytelling, which could be anything. There was a question earlier about music and sound effects. It would be tempting for us to include portions of film in our podcast. You know, here's this great scene, listen to the dialogue of these two guys. And here's a bit of, well, that, like that. You're starting to go into this realm of what's copyright. What's, like, I'm not a copyright lawyer. I don't have money to pay for one. So what's fair use? What's educational use? Am I willing to defend myself? Like if, if we had a bit of Jordan Peele's nope, <coughs> or audio in there, what if he contacts us and says, you get rid of that stuff? You know, I mean, I could, I could defend it, yeah, yeah, but like, you know, easier just not to do it. Yeah, the trick with copyright, and you, you do need to realise you operate in Australia, Australia has its own copyright law. Mm. It came out in the 70s, federal legislation, so it re relates to any media creation. There is an exception for, ed for teachers, so there's a 10% rule for teachers, and, and they get the biggest luxury under Australian copyright law. But the trick is, what Surrey's just saying there, if you put that in, and then let's say Jordan Peele's lawyers reach out to us, guess what we have to do? We have to go re-edit our episode and that could be something that then is years ago so the old-fashioned rule it's the same like when i do films is you want your stuff to you either own the copyright or you pay for the copyright okay so royalty free so which is there's some examples here royalty free unfortunately you can't put metallica or justin bieber or anything in there without getting their permission if you know them and you can get the latest song go for it they can just give you permission, okay? There is a, like you said, 10 seconds. There's a little gray bit here of, I mean, I was told with film, there's sort of somewhere around the five to 10 seconds, you might get away from it. Is that per clip? Or? Yeah, per clip. I've, also, do, does Jordan Peele want to waste his time suing Mark and Space Brains, which don't really earn much money? He's not going to get a great return on his investment, coming all the way to Australia and blah, blah, blah. So there's, there is grayness here, but, it's best to err on the side of caution with copyright. Creative Commons was created by a media lecturer in the US in about 2002, all talking about how to access images, not only audio, but images and everything. And basically creatives can say when they upload material to Creative Commons, oh, I'm okay with, you know, Space Brains, another creative podcast utilizing my material, but I'm not okay for Coca-Cola to use it. So Creative Commons is actually a way for creatives to sort of dictate how their art, music, whatever, actually does get shared on the internet. You can go there and there's truckloads of audio, video, imagery that is available. YouTube itself, it's very small, but it is growing, also has an audio library that is free, copyright free. On your phones, Apple has a set list of songs if you kind of go in there copyright free. So you can use them on images and video and stuff like that. And Android, Samsung's the same. 
So they realize there's value in them buying the copyright. They buy that copyright or they create it and they give it to us as consumers. You can then go, if you want to spend a bit more money, something like Soundstripe is musicians are putting up and actually Soundstripe now is video and images and everything. So if you, you know, if you wanted particular sound effects or anything like that, you can go in there and with your subscription, what you're doing is you're buying their copyright, okay? And you get it, you actually get a copyright certificate. When you do upload to stuff like YouTube, Facebook and stuff now, there is, pre you know, you might notice if you've ever done anything, there is warnings. You know, you can't upload, again, a Justin Bieber song to your video. Facebook will be like, you don't own the copyright and you can actually start getting into trouble. YouTube's the same. So they don't publish it anymore. That's because there was a really big copyright case in the States and a few years ago that caused those platforms to change. So avoid it, either get some free stuff, invest in it. And there is actually also other ways of getting that. If you want to get something very specific, if you know someone that plays guitar, get them to a song for you maybe. And then also freelancers like fiverr.com. So you could pay a very minimal amount and maybe get a intro song created for you. And then there is this one as well, Dano songs, a bit more expensive, I found it, but he, you can He has sort actually of get... removed his $50 one-time fee. Okay. So very recently, so I used Dano songs, the music we have in Space Brain, so the intro and outro is one of his songs. It was $50 and he had like this big catalog of albums of music, quite high quality, and you could just use it for your bits and pieces. You couldn't add lyrics or change the music, but you could take clips of it, you know, and, and, and go for it. He now though, he does still have it for free public works and education. Space Brains, we don't have any corporate sponsorship. We've got no paid affiliates. You could well argue that comes under the, the, the free public usage because we're not earning money from putting someone else's music on there. So Dano says, I'll, get, I'll let you use my song if you don't earn money from it because I don't mind other people hearing my song and make sure you credit me. And, and look, these are again, just some of the stuff that we've experienced. There's, again, there's everything else out there. Mm. If, if somebody sings a song, it needs to be a public domain song. Then yeah. You can look that up at CCLI quite easily. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. So, so if you got somebody to sing Stay Away to Heaven, that's still copyright. That's yes. still copyright because whoever wrote Stairway to Heaven is the copyright material. Yeah, know. yeah, so it has to yeah. be a public domain. Correct, and mm. that's what's great about Creative <coughs> Commons, that's free. You can go in there and you can actually find out that copyright stuff. Yeah. And, and also the, what's good in there is, is even that category that says, oh, I don't want Coca-Cola to use my song, but oh yeah, a podcaster could. Like, you know what I mean? They kind of can categorize it into commercial identities and non. So, but there is options out there. Again, start with the freebies. You know, that, that would, is always my advice. I really want to sort of show you a couple of the practical sides of, yeah. of all of this. Here's this Audacity application. So what I did earlier today is I grabbed my phone and I grabbed this headset I use for work for my Zoom calls and I recorded the, the little brief introduction we do. As a demonstration, because this is going to be relatively low quality. Okay, so this is what it is. I drag the sound in there and you can see there's a little visual representation of the audio. You'll notice that I've got two seconds of silence. So that's room ambient sound. Important in a second. So I will just pop this here. Hi, and welcome to Space Brains, a show where we enjoy more sci-fi movies and they talk about what was good. I'm sorry. And this is Mark. Okay, so that's the sound. The first thing, we've done, and it's in the little cheat sheet here if you're interested. We're going to the effect. We're going to go to equalization. And we're going to boost the bass, boost the treble, because these things, they pick up mid-range, much like a telephone. And this has lots of presets here. So you can see this bass boost, bass cut. You can make it sound more like a telephone and so on. I've got this one here does both. So we hit that, pumps that up. Now it's still very quiet, so the next thing we need to do is normalize the sound. So this is going to bring the sound, the loudest peak up to what are this negative six decibels. That terminology, so zero in this case, when we're talking about volume on this digital meter, zero is the maximum bandwidth available for sound. If your sound goes above the zero, it gets cut off 
and goes all crackly and is unpleasant. You, you don't want that. The negatives then is, is how far away from that ceiling you are. Now the actual volume that's gonna come out of the speakers is all about your speakers and your amplifiers and so forth. What we're talking about here in digital sound is we're just saying, we've got this much room to have amplitude vari variation in. Zero is the top. And then we've got a, no a noise floor, which is at negative 60. Anything that's quieter than negative 60 will not be heard. We want to work in the negative six, negative 18 range, generally speaking. That's pleasant for people's ears. So, I'll go to the negative six, boom. Hi, and welcome to Space Brains, the show where we enjoy watch sci-fi movies and then talk about what was good and what was great. Okay, so that's a little bit, that's a bit better. You can still hear there's a bit of sibilance there. That's the nature of the phone. I've got this pop shield here, which tends to stop and t sort of sounds, which would have helped, but this is just a cheap microphone. The next thing to notice is if I play here, you hear that? At least you can see it, at, it gets, there's that noise. So that's just air movement. Maybe there's picking up on the fridge, a fan. We can get rid of that effect noise reduction, get noise profile. So now it's gone that section of selected sound. I'm gonna assume that's just background noise. And so when I select the whole file, I can remove that. It will remove that background noise. And I click, these are just all the default values that come in there. I don't pretend to really know what they mean. It works really well. You click that and now when we play it, there's no noise. Hi, and welcome to Space Brains, the show where we enjoy watch sci-fi movies and then talk about what was good and what was correct. I'm sorry, and this is Mark. There you go. And so that's the basic process to do. So equalization, normalization, noise reduction. That will get you 80% of the way there. Further changing that, you might use a compressor that'll reduce loud sounds and expand quiet sounds. That's helpful if someone has a, they talk loudly in places and then they come down to a bit of a whisper. You should try and avoid that with your speech, like talking in close to your microphone and speak at a constant volume if you can. But, you know, things happen. And you wanna keep it at negative six. If it's down at like negative 40, no one's gonna hear it. Yeah, yeah, you know, your yeah. dog might, but no one else. But, and, and the thing is, we all have different headphones and headsets and hearing levels. So the idea is that, as Sari's saying, somewhere between negative 18 and negative six, you don't wanna go over negative six. Yep. Over that, it's gonna be hurting people. And then also, if you go below negative 18, then you're really getting too quiet. Mm -hmm. So somewhere in between there is actually the right number. and. You can Google that all day and get all sorts of audio engineers speaking about it much better than us. So this is that same intro as the other one. Hi, and welcome to Space Brains, the show where we joy watch sci-fi movies and then talk about what was good and what was great. I'm sorry, and this is Mark. Hiya, it's episode. So there you go, so that's, that's the raw, unedited sound that comes straight out of the roadcasters. So the cheap, option is to go with whatever microphone you've got or a phone and then you can equalize it and so forth you can get yourself mixes off amazon i think i included in some in there you can get like 70 dollars jobbies or 150 dollars they'll get you two mics and it'll do a bit of that this, this one here is like the the thousand dollars or 800 dollars depending if you're on special it has built into it a sibilance room remover and a bass booster and it allows you to pre-mix our microphones because as I said I talk a bit quieter than Mark we've also got slightly different branded microphones so they come through differently so I was able to get all of that ready so that audio there is just raw straight in which means it's I tend to find it's good enough not to have to do anything to it so you imagine pre this you do an hour and a half episode and you've got to go through an equalizer normalizer and then you've got to go through and you know, kill noise, and you find bits where there's a pop and you've got to select that out and it took hours to do an episode. Now it, it takes about 40 minutes of, I just come through, I cut off the end, 
I add on our intro. So, you know, I, I come into here, Space Friends intro, outro, I've got here. Where the hell is it? Why can't, there it is. And you drop it in, ah, and it will play it. And then you can shift that around to, you know, this is the outro music, so I put it at the end. And this is what we meant before about like, you know, you can have multiple tracks. Multiple tracks. So if you had other things going on. Yes. Yeah, so all that's... audio editing has those sort of features. And that's, that's where I use that other, the other tool I was mentioning earlier, Presonus. Presonus is more for making songs. So they've got a lot of space here for tracks. Audacity is not great for it, but considering I'm just doing an intro outro track and our voice, it's fine. Yeah. And again, it reduces my workload. You, if the longer you have to spend editing and, and modifying stuff, the less likely you are to continue doing it. We'll have to wrap up there, I think, sorry. Show you anything else, <laughs> but just Pinecast here, for example, it is, I've got four exit plan. You can come in here. This is my audio drama. This used to be on Libsyn, so I, I, unfortunately I had to migrate it and I lost a lot of my listens. Shame, but there you have it. When you like add an episode, you have a title, a subtitle, you can have a season, you drop your audio in. Once you drop your audio in, you can then add some video. Say when you want it to publish. So I use this to publish at eight o'clock at night on a Saturday. I'm not actually there at eight o'clock at night doing it, I'm doing it sometime whenever it's convenient. Episode notes, and then you've got various other options if you want. I think, Nick, you asked me about this, is the episode explicit? So if you've got swear words in there, you might want to sort of say, yes, it is. Because if you say it's not, and then you've got someone dropping a whole bunch of F-bombs, someone might go, it's not really a problem, but someone might complain. And it's someone like Apple iTunes might go, hey, we're going to take it. You said it was not explicit, but this is really quite rude, or you're covering very controversial topics. We're not going to put it up there because people and who don't want to hear that. YouTube's become very strict on yeah. that with the children thing. They've, they've really cracked down on that. And if you put up anything and they find something, they'll just block you now. Like, yeah. The new one here, of course, is to create a new podcast. You can start from scratch. And here's where you, you choose the name. A slug, which is a terribly named thing. That's just a convenient little name. So our, our slug, for example, is literally Space Brains because it'll come up as pinecast.com slash feed slash Space Brains. And there's your categories. I suppose the point from here is just if you're really keen, like I've got to speak to about half of you about your podcast idea. If you're really keen, well, then make that commitment to yourself. You know, you, we had to jump in the deep end eventually and hit record. So we've tried to give you a whole bunch of kind of like, yeah, you can just do this with the tech you've already got. Small investment, $50, $100, you can go another level. A couple of hundred bucks, you can probably go another level. But my advice would be just starting and using what you've got and see if you kind of like it. If you can get beyond about six episodes, a lot of podcasts don't get beyond six episodes. So if, you can, if you've got some content that can keep going beyond six, you'll be good, all right? But as I said at the start as well, offer, reach out to us if you've got further questions, send us an email, you know, contact us on socials. Yeah, if you've just got specific questions or anything like that, then seek us out. We're more than willing to, to pass on our advice, okay? All right, thank you very much. Thank you.